Good uh, morning or good afternoon. I'm not sure what the time is. Um, so thank you very much. My name is Ran Neuner. I'm, uh, some of you may know me as Crypto Man Ran from CNBC. I host the world's uh, currently only dedicated televised TV show on, on cryptocurrency. Uh, I've got a very astute panel over here. I'll let the panel introduce yourselves just very quickly so we can get to the meat of things. Uh, Ruben, if we could start with you. Hey, thanks. I'm Ruben Brahmanathan um, from Coinbase. Uh, I've been at Coinbase about three years. I've been in crypto since about 2013. Uh, first as a lawyer um, and more recently leading Coinbase Asset Management, providing um, index funds for cryptocurrency, really focusing on diversified exposure to crypto as an asset class. Uh, hi, my name is Sam Teagle. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at CTX. We're an institutional exchange for digital assets. Um, we're looking to bring regulation, compliance, technology, and market structure that's familiar from the traditional asset classes into uh, the digital world. Um, we recently uh, raised our Series B that's led by Bain Capital. We're about 35 people in Chicago. Um, launching in the next month or so. Um, and my background's in institutional trading. I spent 15 plus years in HFT market making with firms like Jump and Sun Trading, trading, um, building market making models in businesses in equities, FX, and treasury. So liquidity conversations are right at my alley. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. My name is Will Peets. I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer for Passport Digital Holdings. Uh, we're a crypto focused asset management firm. I uh, describe us as a, a, a multi-strat, investing both in liquid currencies as well as uh, early stage projects. Um, again, pure emphasis on active management and trading. Uh, we currently have a, a team of 12. View this as a very kind of inter interdisciplinary space and uh, have built a, a, a team accordingly. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Kevin Zhou, <coughs> and uh, I'm, I run uh, Galwa Capital. We're a crypto hedge fund that specializes in OTC trading, um, algo market making. Um, and uh, I've been in the space for about seven years. Okay, so I think we're at a, quite a unique time now uh, to be hosting this panel. We had the big announcement by the Yale Endowment Fund last week that you know, they're finally entering into crypto. Why now? Where have they been and why right now? I can take a, a stab at that. I mean, I think you know, there's, there's a couple things that people point to a lot uh, as impediments to institutional capital coming into the space. Um, part of that is infrastructure. So a lot of people talk about custody, you know, trading platforms, um, you know, and associated liquidity. I, th I think the other piece is also just education. I think it's taken time for, you know, various more traditional institutional investors to come up the curve and understand what the value proposition is for investing in, in the technology. Um, and I think now that you've seen you know, some of the more traditional venture funds come into the space, it's making it easier for the likes of Yale to, to enter. So I think it's kind of a, a culmination of all those things that are, are making it a little bit easier. Um, so I want to I challenge you on, on a few of those points. Um, in terms of education, you've got to argue that someone as astute as the Yale Fund has known what Bitcoin is and what crypto is for a really long time. We can't assume that sitting here in this room, we're much smarter than the biggest investment managers in the world. Um, so the, again, my question comes to, is this because we have now institutional grade custodianships? Is it because they believe that, is it because they believe that maybe Bitcoin or the crypto markets have reached some kind of bottom and that this is when they want, they want to be coming in? Um, I don't think it, that it's really a function of, of um, them just learning about the technology now. No, I don't think it's, I think it's something they've probably been observing for a while, but I think there's a lot of different applications and use cases that are being, um, you know, better understood. I think it's kind of standard, not the test of time, but certainly being around for you know, 10 years now uh, provides a lot of, of you know, comfort, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, for those sorts of groups. I mean, you're seeing you know, uh, adoption in lots of parts of the world for very specific use cases. You're seeing groups like uh, BIT, which is based in Barbados, that's building an entire technology stack for the Barbados Central Bank that anchors back to the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a very novel use case. And so I think, again, it's just, the maturation of all these different applications and, and use cases. I don't want to host or hog the here. Yeah, I think it's also like each institutional investor has their own decision cycle, and and you can't predict where on that uh, that cycle they are, that that time frame, and everyone's different. But I think there is a convergence of some of the infrastructure pieces that we're talking about, like custody, prime, more liquidity. Um, and I think that the, the thing missing still for most large investors is a lack of a fundamental valuation model for most of this asset class. Um, but I think some of the smart money is seeing that as an opportunity, making a bet now um, before the clear valuation models emerge and, and everyone moves in. So I'm going to 
take you back to 1996, 7, 8, and towards 2000, where we had the internet bubble. Uh, I was a, a victim of the internet bubble, if anything. And I remember that at that time, we also had no valuation um, metrics. Uh, I, I, I was moved from being a gold analyst, which was quite easy, to being an IT equities analyst. And I went from talking about production costs to talking about companies that had no revenues and you couldn't even use a PE multiplier. But yet, all the funds were climbing in. So when the tech bubble happened at that time, all the funds were climbing in. Do you think that this is different because it's actually a different type of financial instrument? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's pretty much the same thing. I think there's been a huge um, misallocation of capital um, into a lot of the projects that are out there. Um, you know, probably some good things will come out of it, just like in the tech bubble, there were a couple survivors that did make it big, but um, I think, you know, for the most part, you know, it doesn't make sense to fund a company uh, before there's a product market fit for, you know, 50, 100 million, right? Like, this is a bit too much, right? And there's a, there's a reason that there's a VC model where you do several rounds, you have to prove out certain things, certain metrics, certain growth. Um, uh, you know, certain growth percentages. So, yeah, I mean, I think overall, uh, you know, capital's been a little bit too loose, and it's because, you know, people, I guess, are greedy, and they want to chase um, these insane returns that you only see, um, you know, in crypto. And I, I do think that the tech bubble is a good analogy. I think there's a lot of um, potential applications and use cases that people are envisioning now, but they're, they're too early for where the tech's at, and you saw the exact same thing in the tech bubble, right? Like, the pets.com in the world was like the poster child, but actually those you know, Instacart and Pets.com work now, now that the infrastructure is built, they were just too early and you had a lot of hype. And I think the other difference here is that it's being driven by retail capital out of the gate as opposed to institutional capital, which is a little bit different than previous cycles. And you're also, because you're democratizing, you know, raising of capital, you're allowing everyone in the world to speculate simultaneously. And that creates another potential, you know, kind of uh, gasoline on the fire, if you will. So I think it's the right analogy. I think we still have a ways for there's a lot of dispersion that will need to happen between low quality projects and high quality, and it just takes some time for that to, to flush out. Yeah, <clears throat> and the way I look at it too is it, we have to remember that the market cap of the whole space is still quite small. And I think uh, Chris Kincannon at the STA this week mentioned that the total market cap is one fifth the size of Apple. So for institutional investors to actually move money, it's still relatively immature. And I often kind of make the joke that institutional traders really would like to. Uh, trade via Goldman Sachs, on to, trade on NASDAQ, and custody at State Street. But for each of those big institutions, they all have people looking into these projects, but the revenue opportunity versus sort of being too early, I think, is a little bit out of balance. So my opinion is that that's why you see a lot of fintech firms innovating in the space and will be the, the leaders. So I want to touch on that point, the one about uh, trading at Goldman Sachs and custodians. Yeah. I call it the, the pension fund manager's test. And the, the pension fund manager's test for me is when the pension fund manager stands in front of his board and you know, you know, they all wear like gray pants and gray, and he stands there and he says, I invested in this thing, which is a, it's a, it's a token, it's not actually equity. You have no rights and no claim against the company, and where did you store it? I stored it at BitGo or at Coinbase. And the question is whether that, what his board would say about those institutional solutions. And I think the question which I'm asking is, I know that there are great institutional custody solutions that are, that are being built. Um, but we haven't seen a big name. I mean, we've seen Coinbase and we've seen, we've seen BitGo and we've seen some others. But do you think that that's enough for the pension fund manager to stand in front of his board and say, I stored these tokens at this place and feel that, he, that he's okay about that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, speaking on behalf of Coinbase, that's, that's one thing we have to get right, right? Like, we have to be able to demonstrate that confidence in the solution, not having the brand name of some of those traditional custodians. Um, and we have to explain, I mean, it's about education to show that in this space, having that brand name is not necessarily the most important thing. It's the, it's the confidence in the, in the solution and the tech that, d that delivers the value of the custodian here. So I agree with you, but the problem is that when you're dealing with, with hedge funds and when you're dealing with huge pension funds, they're very risk averse because they know that even the smallest little wobble can wipe out the entire fund through a run on the fund. So they are possibly the most risk averse people on the planet. Now, we're going to these risk-averse people, and we're saying to them, look, Coinbase is a great company in crypto, but in the real financial world system, would a pension fund manager actually be, be happy to hand on his heart, put his, his, and stand in front of the board and say, I stored this token asset thing that I bought at a company called Coinbase? I would just say that because, again, the market cap, there's so much money in the hedge fund space and so much capacity that for the space to grow a lot, the pension funds realistically are going to be the last to come on board. 
is my, my thought. So there's more sophisticated investors that are willing to take the risk that would be the next wave before you see something like pension funds, is my, my view. Yeah, I agree. And I think now, Ren, you're talking about valuation. Um, you're talking about volatility rather than custody. And I think that is why, to date, the lens through which institutional investors have looked at crypto is, is VC, right? It's, it's an allocation of VC. It's a bet on a manager who has a strategy, right? We're really um, at the start of seeing people make a bet on this actual asset class. That's when the shift happens. Now, let's, just, let's talk about this asset class. Let's talk about the same fund manager, pension fund manager, endowment fund manager, standing in front of his board and saying, look, it's not actually equity that we bought. It's like this token of an open source protocol where there's actually this thing called a foundation and there's no value in the equity. How does that fly? But, but I think that's evolving though, right? Like I think a lot of the projects last year where they issued a medium of exchange token and you have all the characteristics you just mentioned, yeah, that's not investable, it will never be investable, and it's likely not going to work. I think you're seeing a, a pretty quick evolution in how these deals are structured, right? You're seeing you know, a project like DYDX is developing a protocol and then they're building an application on top of that and they're hoping that the value accrues to that application and that's something that's, again, more akin to Red Hat or other projects. And so I think you're gonna see a, an evolution in that. I mean, sure, there's gonna be Ethereum and other platforms where they're by design is supposed to accrue value to the protocol and they're going to have this token and you're going to have to like think through how they to value that. But, uh, you know, I yeah. think it's evolving, I guess. In my yeah, maybe just to add on to that, I would say that, you know, I think institutional adoption uh, happens in cycles. First, you're going to see the family offices, then the prop shops, um, and then maybe some hedge funds, and then, you know, maybe the, the banks themselves, and finally, uh, endowments and pensions. So, you know, they definitely come, come latest, I think, because there's so much career risk associated with, just like you were saying, you stand in front of the board, you, you can't say that, right? I mean, you can't say that you're custodying anywhere else besides State Street, right? So, um, I think, you know, it just takes some time, on one hand, for a lot of these custody solutions to build out their brand and to have a track record of not getting hacked. And then also um, for, at some point, I think there's a tipping point where sort of the, the fear of missing out on this new asset class is greater than, the, you know, the risk of, um, you know, potentially having, you know, looking bad or storing it with people um, that you may not initially feel comfortable with. Yeah, so, I mean, speaking about that fear of missing out, I, I tweeted the other day, I said, um, hey, fund managers, is it more risky for you to hold Bitcoin or not to hold Bitcoin now? And I think uh, what I was alluding to is, is this institutional FOMO. Is there such thing as institutional FOMO? Do you think that, and if there is, is that going to be a catalyst to like Bitcoin going from say six and a half thousand to a hundred thousand? Because we have, like you say, we have a very small market, which is very, very illiquid. And there's a lot of institutional money out there. And for them to make this space worthwhile, they need a market cap of way over a trillion dollars. Yeah, I would say that it's a very slow FOMO, you know, like a medium sized uh, institutional investors then make the market big enough for larger investors. And then those guys make it, you know, big enough for the endowments and sovereign wealth funds and that sort of thing. But, but, but I broaden the discussion on, on what the use case is, right? So I think, you know, Bitcoin has a killer app in the countries like Venezuela or anywhere that has an inept central bank and they're looking for some alternative. It also has, you know, a use case of like Bit that I mentioned earlier. But the, the, the real, motivation for a pension fund or endowment to enter the space should be you know, projects that are, say, distributed compute or distributed storage or anything that will um, impact companies that they already have exposure to, right? So if it's, if it's something that replaces what Dropbox is offering and that pension fund has exposure to you know, Dropbox, just to have a simple, simplistic example, if this technology is going to reduce the margins of that investment, then that's the rationale for investing because it will be, by definition, a, a um, diversifier to their portfolio. Like all these studies about, oh, had you held Bitcoin for the last two years, your Sharpe ratio would end up, like that's complete garbage, in my opinion, just because it wasn't investable, it wasn't big enough, so it wasn't really an opportunity, and you didn't understand what the, the purpose was, but if you start having more defined use cases that have a purpose that also, you know, squeeze margins of their existing investments, like that's what the CIO should be going to. To, to make a case for. That's a very interesting uh, take on the situation because a lot of the speculation is that the institutions are going to enter Bitcoin first. Uh, you're saying that maybe the thesis is not to enter Bitcoin first, but to actually go into industries that you understand, utilize, invest in, need, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think it's an easier case for a, a CIO to make, and that's part of the reason why you're seeing go, capital go into venture funds because they are focusing on those sorts of applications. I mean, the reality is Bitcoin is the most liquid. It's the most talked about, and so you do need to see you know, the killer app for Bitcoin, which I would make the case already exists. But yeah, I think for, for broader adoption and broader investment in the asset class, you need to have more of these use cases that are understood by the likes of the, 
the pension fund CIO. Do you mean more like equity investments in companies using those protocols, or do you mean in tokens themselves? Well, it could be either, right? I mean, you know, again, if, if, if it's a project like Filecoin, right, again, we're not going to debate whether you believe in the project or not or the token economics, but just conceptually, if it's going to be a replacement for other technology that you, you know, invest in via an equity investment and it's going to disremediate and hurt the margins of that investment, then it's, it's you know, relative moving in. Likewise, there's a project right now uh, called Provenance that's coming from Mike Cagney, right? He was a previous CEO of, of SoFi. And it's going to be a, a platform for issuing HELOCs on chain. It's, it's not this kind of decentralized utopia that everyone talks about. It's a permission blockchain to enforce governance. But it's essentially you know, a much more efficient version of the existing mortgage trading market. And it's going to squeeze margins by about you know, 66%. And that's going to hit State Street and every other like investment bank or group that's you know, focused on that. And that's a huge market cap that people have exposure to. So, I think those sorts of use cases, and again, we're early because they're still being defined, the crypto economic models are being defined, the valuation models are being defined, but I think that's going to easier, it's an easier case for a CIO to make to enter the market. I think related to is then you have more, better likelihood of have, having a fundamental valuation around it that people can trade and invest, and in. that's uh, right now it's a blocker, it's purely a quantitative game. Now, Coinbase is working on a whole lot of bundled products. I mean, there was an index product, and I've seen you guys advertising for, for other positions which allude to the fact that probably many more of these products are going to be coming out. Is that something that is going to bring consumer liquidity in? I mean, do you think that consumers are going to press one button and just want to buy a passive crypto index? Yeah, definitely. Um, and this comes back to this being a retail-first asset class, right? Being the growth being driven by retail. Um, and based on you know, our understanding of our consumer base, like 20 million plus accounts, we see this common theme of people excited about crypto, starting to learn a little more about the technology, but not knowing where to start. How many people have actually bought the index? Uh, if I don't have the details right now, so sorry, Ran. Um, still early days, like we just launched the consumer bundle product two weeks ago. So basically the problem is trying to solve is like, I, uh, which one do I pick, right? There's too many. And as more coins get added to Coinbase, no, I'm not telling you which ones are coming. As more coins no, get- I, I work for CNBC, I've got that information. <laughs> yeah, <you're> right. <laughs> Pump it. Um, <laughs> so as, as they, you know, more assets come onto these platforms, ours and others, these diversified exposure products add more utility, um, portfolio management tools, rebalancing, all this stuff. So you mentioned that this is a retail first revolution. Well, I think you, you, I used the word revolution. I'm not sure what the word you used was. Do you think that even after the capitulation of the retail investor who bought in at the market cap of 800 um, uh, billion last year, do you still think that the next wave is going to be driven by the same retail investor? Because I, I'm quite in touch with a retail investor. I've got a, a reasonable Twitter following. And let me tell you, my Twitter followers are burnt. They ain't coming back to the market anytime soon. I mean, the, there's so much salt on Twitter, it's even worse than the salt guy in, uh, in the restaurant. So, uh, I mean, do you really think that, I mean, one of the views that I have is that the retail investor got absolutely burnt, realized that he has absolutely no idea how to play in this, in this space, and if they're coming back, they're coming back to Bitcoin or maybe to one of your index type products. But I certainly don't think that the retail investor is going to be anywhere near continuing to lead this revolution. Well, I think you might have alluded to the answer there in that they're going to come back to the, the, the larger, more stable, more well-understood assets rather than speculating on altcoins. Um, the people that have been burnt on altcoins might, might still come back into Bitcoin, ETH, larger market cap assets. And then there's a whole new class of people who will come in because of the advancements in technology and use cases and institutional investors, right, who, who, um, who will come in for reasons other than speculating on alts. Yeah, Rand, just to add on to that, you know, I think part of that demographic is probably never coming back to altcoins, but I think some of them probably will, you know, in the sense that every time you go to the casino, you're getting burned, basically, but people keep com coming back to the casino, right? So at the end of the day, I mean, if people like to gamble, that's, you know, what it is. So what you're saying is this revolution is going to be le led by dopamine addicts, basically. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say that that would be what leads it, but I certainly think that part of that demographic would come back because of, you know, dopamine, let's say. <laughs> I mean, who, who here really believes that they're not a dopamine addict? I mean, we're a bunch of dopamine addicts. Let, let, let's not look, let's not, we look for the excitement in, in everything that we do. It's probably the wrong sample. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're still around, yeah. We need a neuroscientist on the panel for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about over-the-counter. So we hear these rumors all the time that there's a big buyer looking for $500 million worth of Bitcoin, and he's not putting it through exchanges. It's only happening over-the-counter. What is going on? Uh, yeah, uh, we see, actually see a lot of these blocks come through our desk. Uh, none of them ever close. I mean, these are all just phantom blocks. Um, I, I've actually had a couple theories on why that's the case. You know, initially what I thought is that, you know, maybe what it is is people are trying to create phantom interest in, you know, a certain coin. You know, they're saying that, oh, you know, there's a billion dollars, of, people are going to buy a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And then they want other people to kind of like go in front of that and buy up the price. Maybe they're already holding a lot. Um, so, you know, that was one of my theories. Uh, another one of my theories and why this is happening is, um, you know, it could be, I thought maybe, the, you know, the government just wants to figure out where all the dark liquidity is, right? You know, they, they already see all the lit venues, they, they have relationships with all the exchanges, but they're not exactly sure in these dark pools, uh, you know, with 4OTC, how the funds are flowing. Now, you know, finally I came to my, my, my third idea, which is, I think is the most reasonable, which is that I think there's just a lot of scammers out there, and they're really looking for people who have a lot of coin, and then what they're gonna do is probably like port their phones or do some kind of phone porting attack, um, which has actually happened uh, to quite a few people in the space. So I, I think that that's what's really going on with these large phantom blocks. Are you seeing institutional demand at the OTC level? Do you get phone calls from institutions saying, look, we want a very basic block of Bitcoin, or we want just a block of Ethereum? Um, we, we actually do. Um, I would say that probably um, some of the desks that have been around longer than us um, see more institutional flow. But I would say that the, the type of institutional flow is very much like small hedge fund or family office. Not to the extent that, you know, like some large pension is looking to buy it. So when you say small hedge fund or family office, what type of, what block sizes are they buying? Are they looking for a million dollars at a time? Are they looking for $50 million at a time? Um, yeah, so we regularly see um, one to two million across our desk. Uh, you know, sometimes it goes as high as like four or five mil. Um, over a multiple, that's for, for a single clip. Um, I would say that the largest that I've heard of actually crosses 75 mil in a single clip, but it wasn't through our desk. And then um, I would say that, but if you look at multiple clips for like a, like, like some guy wants to just, you know, uh, buy up like tons of, you know, this one coin over like two weeks. Uh, for that, for like the full trade, I would say maybe about 30 mil we've seen. Um, so, you know, around that kind of range. So, I mean, by that, that's confirmation that it's not actually big institutions. Like you say, it's probably large investors, whales, family offices. Yeah, mostly I would say it's um, large, uh, in, yeah, basically wealthy investors, um, family offices and small hedge funds. Yeah. So I want to spend the rest of this, the, the, pan, the panel time talking about what actually needs to happen in order for us to get real inflows back into crypto. Let, let's get more practical and let's look at what needs to happen so we can then all go home and kind of look for the signs on the wall, on the, for the writing on the wall to say, hey, we said this needs to happen, it, it's actually happened. And also, let's try and be, a, I think the bear markets made us very realistic. We, 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 I think we were unrealistic in the bull market, we were all very optimistic, but I think if anything, this bear market's made us quite sober in terms of how long this revolution is actually going to take. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start with you, Ruben. Just what do you think still needs to happen for us to get real inflows back into crypto? And maybe give us some idea of how long it's going to take to build these things that we talk about. Yeah, I think we've been talking about institutional investors, this wall of institutional capital coming in for at least 18 months now, right? I think it's still, we're seeing more building blocks, right? The necessary but not sufficient conditions to actually get that, that capital in. Um, I think What's missing? What's missing? It's the things we were talking about before, right? Like fundamental valuation models, institutional custody, um, the like regulated trading venues. Like all these things are coming. Um, we have a much better idea now of when they're coming than we did 18 months ago. But it's still like, even if you have the convergence of all those things, um, it, it doesn't like it doesn't guarantee that it's coming and just enables it. So I think we get to the point where we have all these things met within the next six months. But whether that is like the whether there's other blockers that we don't know about yet, that's still the big question. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Obviously, we're trying to build a regulated exchange to be part of that solution, but we also need custody and prime brokers and other things as well. Um, and I agree that even when all those things are done, you still need a, a catalyst in, on the valuation side that drives more money into the space. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked a lot about on the, the use cases, applications, the valuation models, the education. Like, I think that's all true. Um, I think for institutional players, they do need regulated exchanges and a broader 
range of, of derivative products so they can actually manage the rest of the portfolio and adjust exposure. So I think, you know, like what SeedCX is doing, you know, they have a swap execution facility that enables them to offer a lot of derivative products that cur aren't currently on the market. I think that's important to allow institutional capital to participate. I think the one misnomer that people got caught up in, especially last year, was like, oh, there's going to be, you know, a futures product, the market's just going to rocket in, in, in reality that allows for price discovery, which means people can short and you have a more efficient market, which is healthy, but again, it's different than saying Especially the market's going to go up. Especially when it's a cash-settled market, not an asset-settled market. Well, right. I, I right. think in that case, I mean, the market makers are already to trade, but there wasn't any customers ready to trade. Right. So uh, there's volume, but they you had to have customer flow and real use cases, and that was a little ahead of it. Right. But when you, when you talk to the desks, like you talk to Morgan Stanley or anyone who's more traditional, I mean, they're, they're waiting for demand from institutions to come in, and they will trade this asset class, right? They're not going to have a view on where it's going, but they're going to, you know, offer their swap product. They're going to be, again, a, a liquidity provider, and that just takes demand, which then it's a circular kind of chicken the egg argument, but then you have to have, you know, projects that are investable, you know, valuation the, models, et cetera. In the bull market, we heard of a lot of institutions actually saying, you know, Goldman said they're going to start a, a crypto desk and stuff like that. That news has kind of gone quiet now. I mean, do you think that they sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what happens, or do you think that they actually are building in the background? Well, I, I'll give a, a tangential data point. So, you know, we spend a lot of time educating. I mean, we've been a hedge fund for 18 years, right? We have a lot of traditional LPs in our previous fund. We spend a lot of time educating that client base now. So we'll talk to Alborn or Cambridge Associates or these traditional um, consultants, and they're spending time this year doing essentially what we call like operational due diligence on the asset class, right? They're just trying to figure out <laughs> what this asset class is, what's custody, what are the risks. You know, if we sit down with KPMG or ENY, we explain to them how they can validate that we have control. Like that's where the asset class is. And so that's a prerequisite for any institutional capital coming in. So, you know, that's happening right now and they're spending the time because we're spending the time you know, with them. And I know Coinbase has those sorts of discussions and trying to, you know, educate and fulfill you know, RFQs from those types of groups. So that's really boring, mundane stuff, but that's kind of the, <laughs> you know, what requires these type of groups to, to come into the market. How far away are we from them completing this? I mean, how, how, far away, how far away are we from them having sufficient due diligence on the asset class, sufficient knowledge on the asset class, and ready to press some triggers? Is it a three-month thing? Is it a two-year thing? Well, I guess for Yale, they already completed it. So I, I think that's a good leading indicator of, of how far along we are. And I think you know, next year you'll see a lot more examples like that. So I'd say it's yeah. six so months. A, 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 lot of, a lot of the speculation around the Yale thing was, um, it was speculation that Yale was just taking a little dip into the asset class to almost as a PR stunt, to almost say, look, we're the first big endowment to do this, and kind of flashing it in, in the Harvard uh, endowment's face and going, you know, we were the first, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I appreciate that they, that they have done it, but they're not all in. They're by no means all in. For an, for an endowment that's in the billions of dollars, they probably invested no more than $100 million in the asset class, which is a, a little sprinkle of salt. Sure, it, but it's still like a, a fundamental first step into the asset class, just like a retail investor when they buy their first little bit of Bitcoin, then they start to have some skin in the game and, and start to actively learn. You know, it's, it's the process of the operational due diligence. It's the process of vetting the manager and the strategy that enables them to take the next step. So I, 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 you I want get, to learn I about you. something, buy it. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Kevin, what, what do we need? And when is it going to be ready? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of timing, I think it's... Uh, you know, it's it's hard to call. But what one thing I've noticed is that whenever someone moves in in one particular industry, then all their competitors follow. So you just need to wait for one person to break rank. Let's say, and now with Yale, you know, being the first um, uh, endowment. Um, and I, I also think that you know different um, different uh, subsectors have they they have different um, timelines, right? Like the sales cycle to convince a pension fund to invest. That's like a two three year kind of timeline, right? You know, convincing a family office, you just have to have one phone call and the guy likes you, maybe, you know, maybe he gets in, right? So I think, you know, it's just like vastly different. And I think it just, it, you know, it'll just happen in sequence. Um, I also think just to add on to what everybody else has been saying, um, you know, one of the things that's missing right now, I think, is just really easy to use accounting reconciliation uh, tools. Um, and, you know, like sort of off the shelf, uh, you know, smart routing technology, right? Like, I, I guess tax, SF off the shelf text tools to, to, to tell the guys how to report yeah, the, exactly. the tax or, or tax exactly. guidance. 
guidance, yeah, yeah. A, a tax guidance and, yeah. and all of that. Um, and I think, um, you know, f for our operations, I would say that between operations, accounting and reconciliation, that takes up about 75% of our time. So like that's, that's what the trading desk looks like. You know, most of the time we're not even doing trading. You know, most of it's just all this other kind of operational Accounts overhead. Accounts and reconciliation. Yeah, exactly. Is legislation a big thing? I is the SEC a big part of this? I is the lack of any word from the SEC a, a huge part of why we're not seeing the adoption? Yeah, definitely. I mean, both directly and indirectly. So directly meaning that investors might not be ready until there's regulatory clarity, but also indirectly because all of the service providers that are doing these things that are necessary aren't going to jump into the game until they have clarity. So it's kind of from both, both angles. We also don't have a lot of entrepreneurs who want to enter a space if there's not regulatory certainty. That's actually why I think highlighting some of the examples that are more uh, look and smell like an open source project are important because it already fits within an existing regulatory framework. Similar like security tokens, it's, you, know, you can say you can dispute the novelty of, of a security token, but it fits within an existing regulatory framework, which I think is So I want to ask you guys a, an opinion. Um, the SEC is obviously balancing two things. They're balancing investor uh, protection on the one side, which is what their jurisdiction is, to, it, it, what they need to be doing. The second thing that they're doing is they're kind of going, look, we want this, this thing to move before we actually regulate it. We may, if, by regulating it too soon, we may actually be, be doing an... I mean, if they, if they had regulated Bitcoin when Bitcoin first came out, maybe we wouldn't have seen the ICO and et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that now's the time to press the button, or do you think that they're approaching a, a, a responsible approach by not having said anything yet? I don't want to comment too much on the SEC, but I will say that it's, it's just a very global market. It's you know similar to the FX market, so that you have global regulatory arbitrage. So that's it's just a factor that if it doesn't happen here. There's nothing stopping things from happening in other places. But a lot of big big countries are taking their lead from the SEC. I think yeah. the fact that we haven't had anything real from Europe is because the SEC hasn't done anything. We had China acting pretty decisively, but that wasn't to our benefit. Um, and I think, the, I think, spin it as you wish, Malta, Gibraltar, etc., may may take their little, and I call them the little chihuahua dog because they're like bark, 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 but actually they're, they're about that big. So that's not going to change the world. They're all, if, all the big ones are waiting for the SEC. I actually think it's pretty constructive what the SEC has done. I mean, I think just taking kind of a a very gradual, pay, like measured approach to regulation and seeing how things evolve, you know, is fine. They're going to crack down on bad actors, and I think you're going to see more and more of that. You know, I thought the comments re Ethereum were positive just because it gave a path that you know it's possible to have a protocol and a token that's a non-security. So I know people want more certainty, but I think to your point, like you don't want to stifle innovation and kind of jump the gun and have kind of a draconian legislation. So. You know, I, I think it probably hurts, a, a, you know, a lot of capital coming in, but at the same time, it's probably a healthy way to approach it. Right. Yeah, I, I, th I think I agree. I mean, the, the other thing that the SEC, SEC doesn't want to do is pick winners, right? And if they go through the list and say, this is a security and this one isn't and this one is, then they're going to do that. So I think the approach they, they, that they're taking of, of like the really low hanging fruit, the, the really scammy ICOs, I think that's a no brainer to do that. Um, but I would be surprised if we see them start going through the list anytime soon. I think just yeah. more regulatory um, f framework. You know, this is what is a utility token. These are the rules of engagement around a utility token. I yeah. think at, at some point that becomes the same thing, right? If the, if, it, if the framework is so prescriptive that anyone can work out what the answer is, then that's basically tantamount to the SEC saying what the answer is. So with the current kind of fudginess, it gives them the ability to, to not do that. Yeah, also, I, going off of what you were saying, Ruben, um, you know, I, I definitely agree that so far the SEC has only gone after the most egregious actors. And, and I definitely agree that they don't want to be in a position where they're picking uh, winners and losers, because then all of a sudden it creates an incentive to then spend a lot of lobbying efforts and lobbying power uh, to then get your own way, right? To have your security token uh, not be a security or be a security or wh however you like it, right? So I think, you know, they have to be very careful about, you know, what they, what they do on, on that front. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Repeat after me. BitConnect was not a scam. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, we've got a few minutes left. I want to talk about this, uh, this thing that we're all not talking about, which is the ETF, this, this thing that's been hanging over us. Is the ETF one of the big silver bullets? Is this like, 
when we get the ETF, it's going to be approved, and then we're going to get this huge run-up because the ETF's all going to be launched, and the ETF actually means that the, that the funds or whoever the ETF providers actually have to buy the underlying, unlike a, a cash settled futures. So is this ETF really such a big, this big deal? And if it is approved, are we going to get this huge run on Bitcoin? I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it doubled very quickly. In price, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I want to remind you that last year, November 11th, Bitcoin was trading at about 6,600, which is more or less where it is today. By December, 20, by December 17th, it was at 20,000. That was on the back of a cash-settled future contract, which required no buying of the underlying at all, no demand for the underlying asset at all. Um, is the ETF a much bigger deal? Is the ETF like, ETF comes and then this thing is gonna, goes from 6,000 to 50,000? I mean, I think it's important for kind of this, the broader institutionalization of the space. I think probably people learn something from last year. There's actually products in the market now, like there's an ETN, you know, that's US dollar nominated that trades out of uh, Stockholm that gives you the exact same exposure. CoinShares has to buy the underlier. So there's products out there that, you know, are similar, but don't get the same headlines. Um, so, so I think it's important. I think it'll drive demand, but I, I think hopefully, and I, because I actually think that the run up last year is probably the worst thing that could have happened to crypto over that period, but I think maybe some people learned. I mean, so if we do get an ETF decision between now and the end of the year, is that gonna be like a big thing? Or do you think the market's kind of said, look, if it comes, it comes, if it doesn't come, it doesn't come. It's not such a big event. Well, I think when the gold ETF came out, the uh, price of gold tripled, right? So, I mean, maybe it's not as extreme, who knows, uh, but I, I could see it moving up very quickly. Yeah. Um I'm not in the business of making any price predictions, otherwise I'd have your job, Ran. But um, I think it's, it, it, everyone acknowledges that it's a big thing, right? Everyone acknowledges it's bringing new capital in um, from investors who have been hesitant, um, both retail and institutional. So as soon as it comes, I, for sure, there'll be a big impact. So we thought that about the future product. We said, you know, the, it's a big thing. If I look at the number of open contracts on the futures contract, uh, on the futures, on both futures exchanges, it's... It's negligible. It's yeah, but look at the the category of investor or, or um, uh, professional who trades futures versus who can invest in an ETF. Like it's a in, entirely different market. Sam, your opinion? ETF. I, I disagree at that point. I was going to make the same point. This is a retail market versus a futures market, which is mostly professionals. So I agree there'd be a bigger impact. Kevin, ETF. Are we going to get an ETF this year? Yeah. Who knows. And if it comes, if it comes, is it going to be a big push on price? Yeah, I mean, like I was saying, I think it, yeah, at least a 2x uh, very quickly. Guys, I think that's, we're running out of time here, so that's all we have time for. I think, uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.